All right. It's been a couple of weeks since we were able to have class due to weather and whatnot, so uh, we're going to quickly just kind of go back over a little bit of what we've talked about already regarding Sarah. Uh, that is the character study with the notes on the table that we are going through. We plan to finish Sarah tonight, or at least be close to finishing. And then next Wednesday, our study will be Joseph, the husband of Mary. Uh, those notes, I'll email those notes out, and they'll be on the table for Sunday for everybody to pick up as well. So as we uh, have discussed regarding Sarah, some of the facts, she is the half-sister of Abraham. Uh, she was apparently very beautiful because both King Abimelech as well as uh, Pharaoh of Egypt both uh, desired her. We know she was barren. Uh, and her name was changed from Sarai to Sarah at the same time Abram was changed to Abraham by the commandment of God after the promise of a son was given in Genesis 17. We know she was 10 years younger than Abraham. She was 90 when she had Isaac and 127 when she died. Uh, we know she was buried in Hebron in a cave also known as the Cave of the Patriarchs because all of the patriarchs from Abraham and Sarah all the way through uh, Joseph were all buried there. So, uh, as we have discussed about her character, we've noticed the events with Hagar back in Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. And remember that there was a broad promise that was given to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him back in Genesis chapter 12 when Abraham was called out of his father's house. Uh, but there was no mention at that time of a son. There wasn't any mention specifically that Sarah would have a child or anything like that. Uh, and whether or not, we don't even know if Abraham shared what God told him in Genesis 12 with Sarah. But what we find in Genesis chapter 16 is that Sarah's concern is that Abraham doesn't have any children. And lineage was everything in that time, and she wanted her husband to be able to have children, and so she gave Hagar to him to, have, to be able to bear children in his name. Now, whether or not, a lot of times the application gets made, as we talked about, Sarah was trying to help the plan of God. That would be speculating, because we're not told in Genesis 16 that that's what, that's what she was trying to do. It's possible uh, that, sh that they had kind of, if... Abraham had told her in Genesis 12 about what God had said, and she had a mind to say, well, obviously, I can't have children, so in order to fulfill God's promise, I'm going to have to give you Hagar. But that thought process isn't detailed in Genesis 16. Uh, but regardless, the fact is she did give Hagar to Abraham. The, Hagar bears Ishmael, and Ishmael, initially, they, they leave because Sarah was harsh with Hagar, then they come back by the commandment of the Lord, and then they stay until the birth of Isaac. And then ultimately, because Isaac is now born, Sarah does not want Isaac to share inheritance with Ishmael. Uh, and there is perhaps some uh, animosity between Ishmael toward Isaac. Uh, they, uh, Sarah wants Abraham to cast out Hagar and Ishmael. God tells Abraham, do as Sarah tells you. The plan that I have is for your seed to be blessed through, through Isaac, not Ishmael. And so um, we see in Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 through 15, that Sarah laughed when she was told by these three men who we know are angels. Uh, these men are telling Abraham about the son that, that she's going to have. Now remember back in chapter 17, uh, Abraham had already been told this. Uh, when God gave uh, the promise regarding the son, uh, he specifically tells him this is what's going to happen. And in verse 17, he laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? So Abraham laughed first. And it's at this point that God says you're going to name him, or uh, verse 19, God, you're going to name him Isaac, which means laughter. Of course, God knew that Sarah would react the same way that Abraham did. And as we talked about, the very last thing we talked about was why would God, or what characteristics of God are kind of being shown in the naming of Isaac Isaac. And certainly, there's 
the thought process that every time they say his name, they're going to remember the fact that you know, we thought this was impossible. In fact, the Hebrew writer references how that they both, uh, they received Isaac from the dead, so to speak, because both Abraham and Sarah were dead in the flesh in the sense of bearing children. Uh, but God was able to, to bring up a child for them. And so, uh, but we know that, that that reminder would constantly be there, that God first fulfilled his promise and that he overcame through his power the limitations of man in nature and in age and certainly in, in being barren as Sarah was. And then, of course, there, there, are, there are some times in both Old and New Testaments where you wonder if there's a little bit of, of God and Jesus, for that matter, sense of humor. Uh, like naming this, uh, the, uh, James and John, the, uh, the sons of uh, thunder. Yeah, sons of thunder. Okay, because why? Why did he name them sons of thunder? They were, they were very boisterous, and they wanted to call down lightning on these towns that wouldn't let Jesus come in, and so he named them the Sons of Thunder, which is, is, you can see a little bit of a sense of humor there from Jesus. And, of course, he was human. He, he had a sense of humor. It's weird for us to think about, but he did. And I, sometimes I wonder if, if God kind of, that was maybe a little bit of sense of humor from God here, naming Isaac laughter from that perspective as well. But regardless, in chapter 18, uh, we see these three men who've come to Abraham. Abraham is telling Sarah to make this meal. And uh, in verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah? He said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. Now, Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing, not to mention the fact that she was barren to start with. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, I have grown old. Shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? Abraham, it doesn't sound like he laughs in this event because he's already laughed in his direct communication, this dialogue with Jehovah back in chapter 17. So they're not really telling him, telling Abraham anything he doesn't already know. But apparently, Abraham did not share that information from chapter 17 with Sarah at this point. Uh, again, that makes you wonder whether or not he shared what had happened in chapter 12 about the promise to God about all the nations of the earth would be blessed with her or not. But regardless, she doesn't know about it until this point. And she laughs. And then in verse 13, the Lord, and of course it's the Lord through these angels that, that's speaking, said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Now, verse 12 says, how did Sarah laugh? An out loud on the floor belly laugh? Within herself. And was she visible? Presumably not, because she's behind the door of the tent which certainly shows the ability of God to know what's in the heart of Sarah at this point. Uh, is anything too hard for the Lord? Verse 14, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then in verse 15, presumably she has now stuck her head out of the tent or has come out of the tent from behind the door. Regardless, she denies it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Now, first of all, strictly speaking, did Sarah lie? Did Sarah lie? She did. Okay, she, she did laugh. Well, she, I guess it depends on how you look at it. She laughed within herself. She didn't laugh out loud. And so when she's responding, I guess... If you were to twist it a certain way, you could make the claim she was telling the truth from a certain point of view. I didn't laugh out loud. And no, she didn't. But she did laugh within herself. And God knew she did. And that's why God says, no, but you did laugh. Uh, it doesn't matter if it was out loud or not. You did laugh. So Sarah did technically lie. But why did she lie, verse 15? She was afraid. Right. That's not possible. It was a laugh of, of incredulity. Incredulity? She was incredulous. Uh, 
Okay, that's not possible for me to have a child. She laughed at the impossibility of it, at the absurdity from a human perspective. Just as Abraham, when Abraham laughed, isn't that kind of the same thing why Abraham laughed? He was laughing at the absurdity of the thought that a, that a man his age and a woman Sarah's age could have a child. Not, it's not necessarily to say that they didn't think God was able to do it. I would, I would hesitate to go that far because sometimes you and I, when we hear something, our first instinct, our first reaction is going to be maybe if something sounds absurd, we may laugh or giggle and think that's hilarious. Okay, that might be our first reaction to something. Now, once we've had time to really think about it and really kind of process it, maybe not so much. I wouldn't necessarily say that Abraham and Sarah doubted God's power, per se, but the, at least the initial reaction was, we're old, we can't have a child. And just the absurdity of the thought, not the absurdity that God of God, but the absurdity of the thought that they could have a child is what has caused them to laugh. Uh, and so, but verse 15, she did lie, she did laugh. She was afraid, though, because, well... She hadn't laughed out loud, and God knew what was in her heart, and he says, you did laugh, and he was calling her out on it. Uh, and now, we don't see any, anything else past verse 15. We don't read any uh, reaction from Sarah or reaction from God or reaction from these three quote-unquote men or from Abraham. Whether or not there's any more dialogue there, it wasn't important for the Holy Spirit to record for us through Moses. But what we do have is the recognition that Sarah was hesitant to say, yes, I did laugh. But from a purely human perspective, can you blame either one of them for laughing? I, mean, I don't think you can. From a, from a human perspective, now, from a, a spiritual perspective, we know that God can do anything. But we have an advantage that Abraham and Sarah don't have or didn't have. What advantage do we have? We see example after example after example of when God says, I'm going to do something, what does he do? He does it. We have the advantage of being able to see how consistent God is from Genesis to Revelation. Now, Abraham and Sarah didn't, didn't have necessarily that advantage. Not, again, not to say they doubted God's power, but again, from a human perspective, you or I would, might would do the exact same thing, to, to just laugh at the, the silliness of how it sounded. Like not, not that God was silly. Thoughts or comments through that? All right. So, that being the case, we go back to uh, our notes. We see that Abraham laughed, for, laughed first. Isaac's name means laughter, and God had commanded it that he be named that. In Genesis chapter 21, when Isaac is born, Sarah actually makes a statement, makes mention of the fact uh, that, you know, who could have possibly have predicted that I would be bearing Abraham a child? And, and it is silly if from the perspective of a human uh, thought process. Going to Genesis 21 and in verse 6, when she makes this statement, again, this is not why he was called Isaac. He was already to be named Isaac back in chapter 17 before she ever became pregnant with him. But in verse 6, Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham, verse 7, that Sarah would nurse children, for I have borne him a son in his old age? Sarah, she's not denying it in verse 6 here in chapter 21, but she did laugh. Okay, she did laugh. And I don't, I don't read anything in back in chapter 18 that, that you know, God was angry at her because she denied it. She was afraid, according to what Moses wrote for us. But the fact is, Sarah, she says, God's made me laugh. And all who hear... Hear what? All who hear what? A barren 90-year-old lady giving birth. Okay? Everyone who hears about this is going to laugh. They're going to be incredulous as well. They're not going to believe it. Okay, again, from a human perspective, she's right. <laughs> she's absolutely right. Uh, verse 7, who would have said? Again, from whose perspective? God's? From man's. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Nobody. Not only was she barren, but she was 90. That, that's 
physically not possible. But God made it possible anyway. Anything through chapter 21? Yes, sir. That's, yeah, yeah. Well, the resurrection of Jesus, Paul says to the Gentiles, that's what? It's foolishness. Foolishness. That's silliness. That, that a human being can be raised from the dead, and yet that's exactly what Paul was preaching happened, and that did happen according to the eyewitness testimony that we have, that Jesus was raised from the dead. But to the Gentiles, that, was, that can't possibly be the case. To the Jews, it was a stumbling block, especially for the Sadducees, but also for the Pharisees who believed in a physical warrior king Messiah instead of a spiritual uh, forgiveness of sins Messiah. So there's a lot of, of uh, there's many, many times in that the Old and New Testaments of the works of God that from an ordinary human perspective, if you were told about it beforehand, you'd say, that's, that's ridiculous. That's silly. That's not possible. And yet, God made it happen. All right, anything else to chapter 21? Well, cl- mm-hmm. yeah, and in chapter 17, Abraham even says, here's Ishmael, and God says, no, not Ishmael, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. So it would seem as though, whether Abraham had that in his mind as of when, in chapter 16, when Sarah gave him Hagar to have children, that may have been, it, does, it wasn't Abraham's idea, it was Sarah's idea. And so it's possible that when she suggested it, that may have been why Abraham went along with it, thinking this may be why, how God's going to bring this promise about. Uh, again, again, and it's entirely, I'm not saying that Sarah didn't know about it and that that wasn't part of her motivation in, in suggesting that. But even if that promise hadn't been made in chapter 12, there's no reason to think she still wouldn't want her husband to have children. Again, that was everything to the Jews and the Hebrews in that day. And so for Abraham not to have children, there would be no more lineage. There'd be no more continuing for Abraham. And so there's no reason not to think she still wouldn't have offered Hagar, even if the promise hadn't been given in chapter 12. But since Abraham did know about it, and that promise about his seed was there in chapter 12, it's possible that that may have been him thinking, okay, well, this, may be how, this must be how God's planning to do this. But then in chapter 17... When God says, I'm going to give you a child through Sarah, he says, no, well, I've got Ishmael. I, 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 you know, that's, that's, that's the fulfillment, right? That's how this is going to work. God says, no, not Ishmael, Isaac. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, think, I think Abraham had faith in the promise of God. And I think at least as of chapter 16, he probably thought it was going to be through Hagar. I, I, I don't know for sure, but we know as of chapter 17, he knew better. Anything else through that? Okay. Right. Well, yeah, I, I, I still think... Yeah. Well, he says in verse 17, uh, or, or Abraham laughs in verse 17, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old and is Sarah? And then he says in verse 18, oh, that Ishmael li- li- might live before you. And, and so obviously when God says this in verse 15 and 16 and that this is what's going to happen, it would seem Abraham didn't realize that's how God's going to do this. 
whether, I, I would assume that he thought it's going to happen through Ishmael, because that's what he says. But God is specific about Sarah being a mother of nations. And so when Abraham falls down, he says, there's no way that's going to happen. Or, or, you know, that initial instinct is, she can't have a child. She's 90 years old. Oh, that Ishmael may live before you, verse 18. And God says, no, it's Sarah. You'll have a son. You're going to name him Isaac. And I'll take care of Ishmael. He's going to have his own thing. Uh, But Isaac's going to be the one. So, yeah, I do think that he laughed about the prospect of the means by which God was going to bring about it. Not doubting the fact that God would bring about it, because I think he had in his mind it was going to be through Ishmael. And so when God says, no, it's going to be through Isaac, that's when Abraham goes, oh, how how is that going to work? But I I think Abraham, when he laughed, he laughed at at the method or the means by which God was going to bring this about through Sarah. And that must have been... Abraham hadn't anticipated that. That wasn't in Abraham's mind regarding the fulfillment of that promise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and isn't it interesting? I mean, we have a couple of examples in in the Old Testament and certainly in the New Testament of, of children being born under very interesting circumstances. Okay, miraculous circumstances, I think we could go so far as to say. Uh, and certainly the parallels to Jesus, you know, there certainly are parallels there. Anything else through that? I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not quite answering that right, Joe. I'm, I'm, okay. All right. We can talk afterwards if we're still confused here. All right. So moving into the New Testament, Sarah, she's mentioned a couple of times uh, in quotations and so forth from the Old Testament. She's mentioned in passing a little bit a couple of times in the New Testament. But there's two main places in the New Testament that her character specifically is discussed. The first one we're going to look at is in 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter directly addresses Christian women Uh, In particular, those women who do not have believing husbands. And he talks about their example. He says in verse 1, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Is Peter saying that Wives who are married to non-Christian husbands can't try to talk to them about the Bible? Is that, is that what he's saying? What is he emphasizing? How, you, how your example is being shown to your husband, which emphasizes not just your life in public, not just your life at school or at work or at the store or anywhere else, your life at home which just kind of bears even further the importance of we're an example 24 hours a day, whether we realize it or not. There is no time off from being an example. But what Peter describes here, it's not, it's not, he's not saying it's wrong for, for their wives to try to teach their husbands who aren't Christians. What he's saying is that let your example be such so that your example speaks especially then if they then try to talk to their husbands at some point about the, about the gospel or about aspects of God's word, what will the husband recognize? Is she a hypocrite? Oh, she talks, she talks a good game, but, you know, when at home she doesn't live like a Christian. Okay? They can see the consistency. And as a result, they can put those two together and see Christ living in these women. And so when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Is he saying it's wrong to get dressed up? Is that what his point is? What's he emphasizing? Your character, your example, the, hidden, the person of inner beauty, that needs to be the most important. Okay? That, it's not to say that you, you can't dress up, again, within reason, okay? not drawing undue attention to yourself, as Paul would talk to Timothy about. However, he says, don't pay just attention to the outside. 
We could talk forever about how Jesus, that's what he referenced the Pharisees as doing. They paid attention to the outside and didn't care about it on the inside. But Peter says in verse 4, Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. A spirit that certainly has those same characteristics that Jesus had. Okay, He was a gentle, meek spirit, and that's the way we are to be, all of us are to be in, in this context, the women of husbands who are women of husbands who aren't Christians. And then in verse 5, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good, and are not afraid with any terror. So he talks about women, holy women from before. Okay, he's going to specifically talk about Sarah, but the holy women of before who trusted in God. Now there's your key component. That's your key phrase. Okay, the character of these women, these holy women from the Old Testament, from the patriarchs and so forth, they trusted in God and they adorned themselves. That term adorn means to rightly arrange. They adorned themselves with that trust, okay? With that trust, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, that's what they focused on, being submissive to their own husbands. And in that uh, particular application, he brings up Sarah. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and then he says, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. <sighs> Is Peter saying that wives need to be calling their, their husbands Lord? Is that, is that the application that, that Peter's going for? I've tried to make that case to Elizabeth. She doesn't buy it either. But why does he bring that up? Why does he say that? Okay. Okay. So, so the aspect of Lord, what, what does the term Lord mean? Sorry? Lord? Huh? Master or one who is an authority? Okay. One who is an authority. One who has the, the power, the control, the authority. But notice that it's not Abraham who forced Sarah to call him Lord. That's not what Peter says. What did Sarah do of her own free will? She called him Lord. She recognized the authority given to Abraham by whom? Who gave Abraham that authority? Did Abraham take it to himself? God gave him that authority. God gave him that authority. As a result of what? Was it just because he was the, the father of the Jews? Is it because the promises were to him so he had special authority? Okay. okay. Man was created first and then Eve. Man wasn't deceived, but Eve was, according to Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is the authority that man has, yes, but it's also a responsibility that he has. And Sarah did her job in being that helpmeet, being that supportive role that he needed her to be. But she did that willingly, not because he forced her or had to tell her or anything else, but because she chose to. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And then he says, whose daughters you are, if you, as Sarah, and as these other holy women who trusted God, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Okay, so it's the, the quality that he brings out about Sarah is that she was submissive to her husband, she recognized the authority that he had, and that that authority, it wasn't just being wielded as, a, as a, uh, some kind of a tool to kind of put her down, but instead he had that authority as a means to fulfill his responsibility that God had given him. That's why husbands are given that. Because they have a responsibility to fulfill. And the only way they can do that is by God giving them the authority that, they, that he does. Uh, 
And so Sarah obeyed Abraham. Now this stands in contrast to, remember we talked before about the uh, rabbinic uh, stories, the legends of the Jews about Sarah being the same as Iska, and that she actually had gifts of prophecy and that there was this constant uh, hostility, maybe not hostility, but this friction between her and Abraham because Sarah was able to prophesy, yet Abraham was the one who was given the promises. And so they were kind of constantly at odds over who had authority and so forth. Is that what that sounds like to you in verse 6? Of course, the Jews don't recognize the New Testament, so it doesn't really do much good for them. But we believe in the New Testament, and we believe in the Holy Spirit guiding Peter to say what he said. And Peter says she obeyed Abraham. She was submissive to him. And, of course, we know she wasn't Isca, and there's nothing in the Scriptures that suggests she had miraculous gift of prophecy either. But she was doing what she was supposed to be doing as a wife. Did I see a hand somewhere? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, like too many chefs in the kitchen, so to speak. Right. Right, absolutely. And, and th th there's an order to the things that God has established. There's a reason for that order. Uh, and when man throws that order out the window, what happens? Chaos. Okay, chaos. All right, anything else through 1 Peter chapter 3? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. And certainly, uh, husbands should share that same thought process as well, is appreciating and, and praising the hidden beauty of that quiet and, and gentle spirit. Uh, you know, not just not just reacting to the outside, but looking at the inside and praising that and encouraging that, nourishing that, as in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Paul describes Christ in the church, husbands, you nourish your own bodies, you should nourish your wife and love her and so forth. See another hand? Yeah, well, and you remember with the whole situation after Hagar, after Sarah realized this was a mistake, we shouldn't have done this, and then in chapter 21 when she insisted that Hagar be kicked out, what does Abraham do? He goes to God. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Sarah doesn't want Ishmael or, uh, uh, Hagar or Ishmael here anymore. And God tells him, you listen to the words of Sarah. It's not that Sarah was in charge. It's not that she had usurped Abraham's authority. But you have that, that relationship that takes place where, you know, Sarah gives, the, here's what I'm feeling, here's what, this, I don't like this situation. And now Abraham, part of his responsibility is to see to that, that situation. Well, what, what should I do about this? And God tells him, listen to Sarah. And, and so, it, again, in that, even in that situation, whether or not we agree with, with Sarah dealing harshly with Hagar, again, it's not Hagar's fault, and it, I wouldn't necessarily say it was Ishmael's fault, although there is some suggestion there was some conflict there. It's, it's, the situation was what it was, and of course, it certainly worked out according to the plan of God. He knew how everything was going to work out. Uh, but I, I, wouldn't, I would say that she was still generally gentle and quiet in spirit, just as Sarah. That's, that's why Peter brings her up. Anything else through this? All right, so the last place is Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter, no, not chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith. 
Abraham is mentioned, Moses is mentioned, several different people are mentioned. Uh, we see how that he obeyed when he was called to go out to the place he would receive, verse 8. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise. Uh, verse 10, he waited for the city that has foundations. Verse 11, by faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, didn't she laugh when she heard about it? And a lot of times there, there are individuals who, who read what happens about Sarah laughing, then they read this and they say, okay, uh, faith doesn't laugh in God's face, which again, I don't believe that she was laughing in God's face. But even so, how do we reconcile that she's in the chapter of faith about having a son, yet she laughed? Okay. And, and the fact that God proved himself. You think of Gideon. Okay, Gideon's mentioned in chapter 11. And yet several times Gideon tested God and God allowed it. Okay, he went along with it and he went ahead and provided proof to Gideon. Uh, and there are examples like that where you have faith and yet that faith needs some assurance. And God often provided that assurance. But it makes me wonder here in verse 11, does it say by faith Sarah immediately accepted the promise of a child? Is that what it says? I would, I would think, yeah. I mean, she's 90 years old. She figures I'm never going to have children. And now all of a sudden she's being told, she's, or well, she's overhearing that she's going to have a child. Yeah, I, again, it's that immediate gut response. That's, that's ridiculous. But I don't think what... Huh? She might have thought he was joking, and of course, at that point, right, right. Well, and to be fair, to be fair, it's not clear that she knew at that point, or even that Abraham necessarily knew at that point, that those three men were actually angels and that the Lord was speaking to them. Okay, they figured it out afterwards, certainly, but Sarah hadn't even seen them yet. She was still in the tent. She was preparing a meal the way Abraham told her to, and she overhears this conversation. She may not have even overheard the entire conversation, just the part about her having a kid. So to be fair, it, she may not have even known that these were angels sent from God. But despite that, what does verse 11 say? By faith, Sarah herself did what? <coughs> Received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child. She, through faith, received what? Strength. To me, that's a key component. Because God had promised not only that she would receive a child, but that what was going to happen with that child? What was going to happen because of that child? All the nations of the earth would be blessed. He would become the father of great nations. That being the case, if that's the plan of God and I am bearing that child, then is God going to make sure he's going to watch over that child? Yeah, God's going to watch over in the womb and ultimately after she's born that child. And so I don't think that there's any conflict between her laughing in this, this immediate kind of gut reaction, how silly it sounded, and the fact that after she kind of understood what was happening, realized this is the promise of God, now, it doesn't say she ever laughed after that about the situation, other than, you know, it's still silly from a human perspective, but God has done this. Well, Sarah, because God has done this, she had faith in God that he would take care of her and the baby. 
And ultimately, at 90 years old, after nine months, she was able to bear that child. All right, that's, uh, that, that's where we'll stop. We will pick up with the questions next Wednesday night and then move on into Joseph, the husband of Mary. Thank you, everybody.